Life on Earth and Beyond, An Astrobiologist's Quest by Pamela S. Turner Between a Rock and a Cold Place, The Dry Valleys, Antarctica Can life survive in a very cold, dry place? At the very bottom of the globe, in a land of ice and snow, there are great curving valleys of bare earth, Antarctica's dry valleys. It's a harsh place. In April, the beginning of the Antarctic winter, the sun goes down and doesn't come up again until September. For months, the dry valleys are locked in frozen darkness. There isn't a single scraggly weed or tiny insect. The dry valleys are almost as lonely as outer space. The Antarctic dry valleys, the dark places in this satellite photo, are the largest ice-free areas in Antarctica. Yet the dry valleys fascinate astrobiologists like Chris McKay. The dry valleys are like Mars, explains Chris. Both are cold and dry. It hardly ever snows in the dry valleys, and when it does, the air is so cold that very little snow ever melts. Mars is even colder and drier. Chris set off to visit the dry valleys in January 2005 during the Antarctic summer. Just getting to such a remote spot was an adventure. Along the edges of Antarctica are huge ice shelves, thick floating platforms of ice. The Ross Ice Shelf near McMurdo Station is the size of France. The Antarctic dry valleys are also nearby. Journey to the Bottom of the Earth To reach the dry valleys, Chris flew from San Francisco, California to New Zealand. In New Zealand, he boarded an Air Force cargo plane to McMurdo Station in Antarctica. The cargo plane had no reclining seats or meal service. No windows either. It was eight hours of being cramped and cold and so noisy you had to wear earplugs, Chris later recalled. Chris's team boards a cargo plane for the flight from New Zealand to Antarctica. Chris and seven other scientists took many boxes of equipment to Antarctica. They didn't have to bring everything, however. The scientists had special cold-weather clothing and camping gear from the National Science Foundation, an agency that coordinates American research in Antarctica. They didn't have to pack food, either. Chris and the other scientists went shopping at McMurdo Station's supermarket, a big metal hut full of groceries. After stuffing two helicopters with camping gear, equipment, food, and water, the scientists flew to the dry valleys. They landed atop a giant lump of sandstone called Battleship Promontory. It would be their home for the next two weeks. Little Green Men Early on his first morning in the dry valleys, six-foot-six-inch Chris warmed his way out of his extra-long sleeping bag. There was plenty of light outside. The sun is up 24 hours a day during the Antarctic summer. However, the sun's rays didn't give off much warmth. Even during the summer, the dry valleys were as cold as Montana in winter. Chris dressed quickly and made his way through the scientist's tent camp. The chilly wind cut like a razor even through downfield clothing. The camp was a little tent city. There was a science tent, a kitchen tent, a toilet tent, and the suburbs, the sleeping tents. Solar panels powered the kitchen tent, fondly nicknamed Cafe Battleship. Chris treated his companions to pancakes with canned cherries on top. Cleaning up was easy. The scientists just wiped everything with paper towels and let the dishes freeze. Nothing rotted or spoiled in the cold, dry air. This is the camp on Battleship Promontory. At the end of the trip, helicopters flew out every piece of trash and human waste. This is the view from Chris's tent. In 2005, there was more snow than usual. Chris has been making these camping trips to Antarctica for 25 years. He knows there are creatures hidden in the dry valleys that can survive some of the world's worst weather. Their secret? They live inside rock. Solid rock isn't always solid. Many rocks are honeycombed with little spaces or pores that seem like huge caverns to super small creatures called microbes. Microbes, also called microorganisms, are the tiniest of all living things. 
They are so small that they can't be seen without a microscope. After breakfast, Chris heads to a nearby sandstone cliffs. He examined the sandstone carefully. Chris spotted little blotches on the rock. A colony of microbes was living in pores just under the surface. With the hammer and chisel, he carefully chipped off a chunk of rock to take back to his lab at NASA. On previous visits, Chris had drilled tiny holes into the sandstone and attached sensors. The sensors measured the light and moisture inside the rocks year-round. Chris's sensors showed that the microbes hidden in the rocks survived on tidbits of summer sunlight and a few drops of snowmelt. Looking carefully, Chris also spied a wet spot on the rock. When that happens, there are microbes cheering. Yay, wet snow, Chris later explained. They are living in little rock greenhouses. They wake up for a few days in the summer when the sun is shining and a little moisture seeps down through the pores in the rock. They grow a little and then go back to sleep for the rest of the year. Chris chipped off another rock sample. Just under the rock surface was a thin green line, a minute forest of microbes cyanobacteria, and fungi. These microbes were real survivors. If life exists on Mars, it might look something like that, Chris later explained. Those little green critters are the best Martians we have, and everyone knows Martians are little and green. A shelter of rock or dirt would be very important for any Martian life. The atmosphere on Mars is too thin to block dangerous radiation from the sun. If any life exists on Mars, it would need to be shielded from solar radiation by rock or soil. But microbes hiding inside rocks or underground aren't easy to find. So Chris uses the dry valleys as a testing ground for microbe detection machines. A closer look at the small dark patch exposes cyanobacteria and fungi. Snowmelt reaches the microbes that are hidden inside the rock. What is life? You'd think the answer is easy. Living things eat, take in energy, and give off waste, right? But a car eats gasoline and gives off heat and exhaust gases. A car isn't alive. Let's add the ability to reproduce. A car can't make baby cars. That doesn't work either. A fire eats wood and oxygen and gives off heat, carbon dioxide, and smoke. It can reproduce, too. A single spark can grow into a whole new fire. The gold circles and rods are the deadly H5N1 bird flu virus. Let's add the ability to evolve. Fire can't do this. Fire is fire. But all species of living things, from bacteria to bean plants to bears, evolve. They adapt over time in response to changes in their environment. So now we have it. A living thing eats gives off waste, reproduces, and evolves. Sorry, but there is one major glitch. Viruses. Viruses are very small, very simple microbes. They cause many human diseases, including AIDS and the common cold. Viruses take in energy, give off waste, and evolve. Flu viruses evolve so quickly that scientists must develop new flu vaccines every year to fight the latest version of the virus. But viruses can't reproduce by themselves. A virus must invade the cell of a living thing, such as a bacterium, plant, or animal, and hijack the cell's machinery to make more viruses. So, is a virus just a fancy bit of chemistry? Or is it possible for something to be half alive? Scientists are still arguing over these questions. There's no easy answer. That's life. Machines for Mars and Beyond. The team brought a gas chromatograph, a spectrometer, and four types of ultraviolet UV lasers to test in the dry valleys. Each machine uses a different technique for sensing hidden microbes. The gas chromatograph senses gases given off by microbes. The spectrometer looked for the kind of light absorbed by microbes. The UV's laser senses the glow given off my microbes when the UV laser shone on them. These are valleys on Mars. The average temperature on Mars is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 60 degrees Celsius. But the temperature can reach 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Celsius during the Martian summer. 
At least, that's what was supposed to happen, but the gas chromatograph didn't work at all, despite hours of tinkering. One of the six machines Chris and the other scientists brought to Antarctica, only two, the spectrometer and one UV laser, were good at finding microbes. Even recording test results was difficult. The ink froze in Chris's pen. Chris was pleased that two machines worked. Science is all about testing new things and ideas. Sometimes things work out, and sometimes they don't. A spectrometer or UV laser may travel on a future NASA mission. The machines may land on a planet that, like the dry valleys, seems too cold and too dry for life. Yet, little green men might surprise us. Kevin Hand, Robert Carlson, and Henry Sun test a spectrometer on rock containing hidden life. Chris can't wait to find out. He's been wondering what's out there ever since he found a dusty old telescope and pointed it into the night sky. Bug-eyed guys with flying saucers. Scientists think that aliens on other planets are most likely to be microbes, not bug-eyed guys with flying saucers. Why is this? Microbial life is the simplest kind. Complex animals take much longer to evolve. As a result, microbial life should be far more common in the universe than complex life. Simple, hardy microbes are also able to live in environments that are too harsh for complex life. That means many more possible homes are out there for alien microbes than for bug-eyed guys with flying saucers. Is life liquid? Atacama Desert, Chile. Can life exist in a hot, dry place? In January 2004, two robotic rovers landed on Mars. Spirit rolled through Gusev Crater. On the opposite side of the planet, Opportunity puttered around a dusty plain called the Meridini Planum. NASA sent the two rovers to Mars to find out if the planet once had liquid water. Enough liquid water for life to exist. In searching for aliens, NASA's motto is, follow the water. As Spirit and Opportunity were humming around Mars, 40 million miles, 64 million kilometers away, Chris and his NASA colleagues were exploring the Atacama Desert in South America. They weren't following the water. They were looking for spots with as little water as possible. An artist's idea of what a rover looks like on Mars. Very little rain on the plane. To get to the Atacoma, Chris and several other scientists and students spent a day flying from San Francisco to Antofagasta, Chile. From Antofagasta, they drove two hours through the desert to a research station. It took Spirit an opportunity seven months to get from Earth to Mars. A research station was just a desert shack that housed a kitchen and laboratory. Water was brought in by truck. The scientists pitched their tents along a line of scrubby trees left over from an agricultural experiment. The trees were the only bits of green for miles around. Soon after arriving, Chris checked his weather sensors. It had rained a few weeks before. It was the biggest rain since 1994, about a fifth of an inch, recalled Chris. For the Atacoma, that's a flood. This is an aerial view of the scientists' camp. The scientists slept in tents at their research station in the Atacama. When Chris first visited the Atacama in 1994, he set up sensors to measure rainfall. For two years, his sensor didn't record a single drop of rain. Chris thought they were broken, but they weren't. The lack of water was good news. Chris had found the driest desert in the world. The Atacama is even drier than Antarctica's dry valleys. There are lots of places where people say it doesn't rain, like the Gobi Desert in Mongolia or the Australian Outback, explained Chris, but the Atacama is truly the driest place we've found. In fact, if the sky over the Atacama were reddish instead of blue, the super dry desert would look a lot like super dry Mars. Looking for life in the Atacama Chris and his colleagues tested the Atacama soil and rocks for evidence of life. They tried some of the same soil experiments used by the Viking spacecrafts when they visited Mars in 1976. If Viking had landed in certain areas of the Atacama, its tests would have said Earth is a dead planet, said Chris. Chris tried other experiments. He brought rocks from other deserts and put them in the Atacama. 
on the underside of the rocks were microbes adapted to living in very dry places. The Atacama killed even those hardy microbes. The Atacama isn't entirely dead, though. Some of the Atacama soil Chris collected did have live microbes. We wondered how they survived, said Chris. Did they grow in the Atacama, or were they blown in by the wind and we found them just before they died? A small pump hanging from the green balloon sucks in air, which will be checked for microbial life. Chris holds the air sampling balloon to keep it from flying off. To find out if the microbes fell from the sky, Chris needs to take samples of the air over the Atacama. If the microbes were blown into the Atacama by the wind, the air would have about the same amount of microbes no matter where in the Atacama Chris took a sample. The conditions on the ground below, less dry or super dry, shouldn't affect the number of microbes up in the air. Chris brought along a helium balloon. The balloon was hard to handle in the desert wind. It bounced around like a crazy ping pong ball. It went every direction but up, recalled Chris. A small pump hung from the balloon. Once the bucking balloon was in the air, Chris turned the pump on using a remote control device. The pump sucked a bit of air into a sealed dish. The balloon was pulled down, the dish removed, and a new one inserted. Later, all the sealed dishes were brought to the lab and checked for microbial life. While Chris was in the Atacama, NASA rovers were scrambling around Mars. At left is a ridge in the Atacama. At right is a photo of a Martian ridge taken by the Spirit rover. Chris found that the air over the less dry areas of the Atacoma had microbes, while the air over the super dry spots had no microbes at all. The balloon test suggests that the Atacoma microbes weren't visitors carried by the wind. Chris thinks that in the less dry parts of the Atacoma, microbes grow in the soil. The dirt is then kicked up into the air by the wind. That would explain why the amount of microbes in the air was the same as the amount of microbes in the dirt below. One thing is clear, however. In the very driest parts of the Atacama, nothing can survive. There does seem to be a limit to life on Earth. At first, I hoped I could find a microbe in the Atacama that was somehow adapted to life without liquid water, said Chris. But it seems that when there is no liquid water, there is no life. There may be no liquid water on Mars now, yet the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity proved that once upon a time, Mars did have liquid water. Lots of it. Spirit found rock that had once been soaked in water. Opportunity discovered wavy bands of rocks formed by a long-lost sea. Scientists think Mars' surface had water for hundreds of millions of years. That's enough time for life to have evolved. So where might we find traces of ancient Martians? Chris thinks that evidence of early Martian life may be in a natural underground freezer on Mars. Natural underground freezer just like the one in Siberia. Water, the host with the most. Unless lost in a desert, we take water for granted. After all, it falls from the sky and we flush it down the drain. But liquid water is a remarkable substance. Water is the essential molecule in the chemistry of life on Earth. Imagine that life is a big party and the most important elements of life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and phosphorus, are the guests. Water is the host. Water is the one who gathers all the guests together and introduces them to each other. Water makes sure everyone's comfy, neither too hot nor too cold. Without water, the chemicals necessary for life couldn't find each other, mix with each other, and react with each other. Life would never happen. In the party of life, water is the life of the party. From space, you can see that Earth is a big, water-covered sphere. Thank you.